If I were to uh, sum up what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to say that uh, digitization and tech policy, or rather using technology uh, for, uh, for doing anything in public services and governance, is all a matter of policy. And technology actually has existed there for a long time. The question is, do you have the political will to actually do something with it that has huge effects. Now, to give you an idea of why, uh, or what my experience has been, is that uh, I did spend a lot of time, and I will mention this later, uh, or talk about it, uh, in terms of pushing my country to digitize. But I really understood how, uh, how different things were when after, uh, after I, uh, <clears throat> finished my term of office, I was invited to Stanford. And while I was there, I had to put my daughter in school, and then I already saw how you register a child for school in the United States. Um, which was, I had to take my electricity bill, drive to the headquarters of the uh, Palo Alto School District, and take along, in addition to the uh, electricity bill, my passport, my, with uh, my wife's passport, my kids' passport, with their visas, and with something called a DS-2019 form, which is something that if you have a J-1 visa, which is a visiting scholar, has to be filled out by, the, by your university. So anyway, I drove down there, and then I took a number, and I waited for 20 minutes, and then I was called, or we were called, and put all the papers there, and then a woman took all the papers and disappeared for about 15 minutes to make a photocopy of everything and came back and then she took the papers and started filling out by hand uh, whatever it was that she needed to fill out. I don't know because she was just filling things out by hand. Now in my country, it, it doesn't happen. I mean basically if my daughter is living with me in where I live, she's automatically registered for school. I mean it just happens. <laughs> Um, and basically what, where we have uh, gotten to in Estonia is that there are only two, two interactions between the citizen and the state or the government that you cannot do online. The first is getting married and the other one is getting divorced. In both cases, you both have to show up. Every other case, you can do it online. Um, and I would say that this is, this process, which uh, really came into, really kicked off in the year 2000, uh, has been, um, it's something that other countries have picked up on, and there are a few other countries that are have really moved along with digitization of public services. But, the, um, and they would, you can mention basically Singapore, Denmark, Finland, um, but um, the US, and bizarrely enough, uh, what some people call the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, I mean, they're English-speaking countries, have really have, uh, have um, are uh, basically anathema, to, uh, the idea is anathema and they don't want to do it and I will sort of get to one, the main stumbling block with this a little, liter <laughs> little a bit later. Now, my involvement in this, in a sense, started with the situation that Estonia was in when we reestablished our independence, since we had been an independent country, and then we were occupied the Sovs, and then we were occupied by the Nazis, and then we were occupied by the Sovs again. But in 1938, the Cambridge uh, history, Economic History of Europe published, uh, has a, in it there's a graph of GDP per capita of European countries. And in that, Estonia is slightly, ever so slightly, ahead of Finland. In nine, and that was, so that was 1938, the last full year before World War II began, and the Finnish Winter War, and all of those things that, that went on. 
1992, so that was the year after we reestablished our independence, in the first full year that we had to measure anything, the GDP per capita nominally in uh, Finland was 24,000 US dollars. Pretty good for that time. The GDP per capita in my country was $2,800. So more than eightfold, a more than eightfold difference in GDP per capita. And the only factor that was there was basically <laughs> being occupied by the Soviets. And the question is, I mean, you look at this and you go, well, we're not, how are we going to get anywhere like this? Uh, because there is the Z, there's Zeno's paradox, if you remember from whatever, about you know, Zeno's paradox is like Achilles can, is running, and there's a tortoise, but he never catches up to the tortoise. I mean, this is, you know, we could have 10% growth and we still would not grow as much in absolute terms as Finland if they only had 1% growth. You're always, if you're, if you're a developing country, you're perpetually trying to catch up because even if the richer countries don't have uh, such a high growth rate, because they're rich, I mean, the 1% accounts for a lot more than a big growth percentage in, in um, a poor country. We see this today with, say, Albania and with, um, Armenia, two countries that have been experiencing huge growth rates, but now Estonia, uh, when it has a minor growth rate, still grows more. So, I mean, faced with this, it was very depressing in the early 90s, going, what are we going to do with this? How are we going to get out of this mess? And all these various, pe various people had all kinds of solutions, most of them pretty bad. <clears throat> but then a couple of things happened to me. <laughs> Um, the first thing was, uh, well, actually, the first thing that happened to me happened in 1971, which was that I was uh, in a small math class with a math teacher doing her PhD in math education at Teachers College in Columbia. So this is 1971. It's 51 years ago. I was 15, 16, something like that. And so she, she did for her dissertation this... Uh, experiment, which is she rented a teletype, which had a perfo tape attached to it, and a big, big telephone modem, modem where you take the, your fixed line phone and you stick it in there, which was hooked up to a mainframe computer 30 miles away. And she taught us how to code in BASIC, which BASIC is baby Fortran, uh, kind of. And, um, I don't know, we were, you know, kids in 10th grade, and we're like, yeah, okay, well, that's cool, and I remember this moment in my life when I screwed up on an assignment, and it was print y equals x squared, but I forgot to end the program, and so it was like this paper was coming, I mean, the thing was coming out, and then I just turned off the teletype. But in any case, um, that for me was like quite the experience because you know, I had already done things like plot y equals x squared on graph paper, you know, those are the silly things you do in, in algebra class, but here it was, just blah, 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 and I was like, wow. So that combined then with two other things. One was uh, I was in the US, um, I had decided to become, I mean, I was invited to become the ambassador, took a 95% cut in pay from my previous job, and it was all wonderful. And sometimes the Estonian Foreign Ministry forgot to transfer money, so we lived on credit cards. But in 1993, um, Mark Andreessen came out with the first web browser. Up till then, I mean, it was four years after Tim Berners-Lee had invented the hypertext transfer protocol, the HTTP you see in front of web pages, and I said, uh, and I, and then you know you didn't download it for free as you do today. Uh, you had to go. I went to Radio Shack, a store that's now out of business <laughs> because of digitization, and I bought for I guess twenty nine ninety five or some price like that a the web browser, and it consisted of seven floppy disks, if I recall, which I had to upload into my computer, and then I got on the web. 
And this was, this, this was the first time people were getting on the web. And I looked at this, I said, wow, and what is the lesson of the web at that time is that this is one thing where even a country like mine is on a level playing field. Everything else, I mean, you know, Europe, the US, I mean, since 1945, all this new infrastructure, high-speed rail, autobahns, interstates, everything. I mean, all the things that were built in the post-war era, we lacked them. I mean, there was, we still had a phone system that was um, from 1938, from before the occupation, because they never really updated anything. It was a kind of a rotary system, and it was terrible. So I said, okay, what we have to do, if we want to catch up, where this is one area where we are no worse than anyone else, it would be in digitization. So I said, that's what we have to do. And then on top of that, what really sort of kicked it off was reading a neo-Marxist Luddite book by Jeremy Rifkin called The End of Work, which basically said, Automization, digitization is horrible, and one example that really leapt out was it was a Kentucky steel plant that employed 12,000 people and produced X million tons of steel a year. And then it was bought by the Japanese, and then they completely automatized and computerized it, and then they produced the same X amount of steel, except instead of 12,000 people, they had 120 people doing it. Which, I guess for, I mean, for Rifkin, this was horrible. If you're a very small country, and in the environment, everyone's talking about economies of scale, you go, wow, this is our way of being able to get out of this mess. So, based on I mean, being convinced that you know, digitization was the way to go, and then also my own experience, basically, I was never a real techie, but since I had been in 10th grade, I was never intimidated by anything technological. It was just like, okay, I know it. I mean, I can fix my computer if it's simple enough, and I can reprogram things. I mean, nothing, nothing seriously techie, but I was kind of like a sort of soft geek, I guess. So I proposed this thing to the government in 1995 uh, that we computerize all the schools. That is, every school gets a computer lab and we connect them all. And um, well, let's see what happens. Uh, met with violent opposition from, from the teachers. Uh, I mean, for about a year, the teachers' union newspaper did not miss an issue without an op-ed saying I'm an idiot or I'm going to destroy education or something like on that order. But fortunately, the, I proposed this at a time when the Minister of Education was the former rector of the National University who had a PhD in astrophysics. And he said, this is a great idea, let's do it. So he pushed it through the government, and so 1996, we started. By 1998, all Estonian schools were, had a computer lab and were online. So this was the first step. I mean, and then I can jump ahead about 20 years and say that um, Estonia has, been pretty wild, uh, a success in, uh, uh, with all kinds of startups that have become unicorns. So we have 10 unicorns, which works out to basically one unicorn for every 133,000 people, which even is four times better than Israel. Um, but I would ask people, how did, you get, how did you get involved? Why did you do this startup? Or why did you do this thing that is now worth a billion? And, and they'd say, oh, I was a kid in your program 20 years ago. And that's how I got started. And that's how I started doing all this stuff. And I, you know, once I was hooked, I was hooked. So that was one way into this uh, with a government that wasn't, that was slightly kind of skeptical. But they said, what the hell, we'll do it. Uh, and then the other side that came into this was the private sector. The private sector, the banks, basically, not even the private sector, but the, the banks realized that digitization was a, was a way to really cut costs. I mean, this is the Rifkin argument. 
uh, because we had all the, we, our country, aside from the big towns, there are a lot of little villages, and every little village had to have at least two banks, you know, a little competition. And they said, no, 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 let's, and so they came along and said, okay, they're putting the computers in, in the uh, schools, why don't we do a program with the government, and it was a public-private partnership, and we put uh, every town hall, municipal center, you know, villages, you still have kind of like a village government center, they put in and paid for uh, a bank of computers. And so people could do their banking. I mean, they could do all kinds of other things online, but they, primarily it was because the banks were pushing this. And um, so we, they had this program where I also would go around and go to a village and they put out like a hundred computers and then invite all the townspeople to come and give them a little tea and coffee and then we'd say, hey, see, this is what we can do. Um, uh, the idea there being that instead of having to have brick and mortar banks in every little village, you can in fact do your banking online. And since at that time Estonia was still quite poor, um, you're not going to have a computer at home. I mean, I mean, as late as 1999, only 30% or 36% of U.S. households had a computer at home relative to, I mean, nowadays everyone has some kind of device, right? But, I mean, back then it was still new enough that it was like six years after the introduction of the web. And then we, and combined with that, we had another program which was we had uh, all over Estonia at the time, they still have a few of these signs up, but there would be signs on the road that would say uh, internet access point with an arrow and then there would be an at sign. So in Europe you have all kinds of single signs that say different things, you know, park or something else. Um, uh, you know, sea view, I mean all kinds of little signs that say, little icons, and this one was the at. And it would say at 200 meters, and then you would you know that if you want to get online, I mean, they would usually, it, this meant that they had either a computer, or, computers, or mm, then a Wi-Fi hotspot, so you could go and send stuff. So um, by the late 90s, realized this is not an adequate system because it was the same kind of system that you use to this day when you say go into Amazon. You'd have like a, one-factor authentication, you know, you put in your email and a password and then, and then you buy something and then pay, some, pay for it. And it, it was clear already 25 years ago that that is an inadequate system. You need, uh, and I will now talk about the, basically, what you need in order to digitize a government. Um, the first thing is you need a secure, unique ID. Uh, what does that mean? Well, first of all, you need to have a population registry which says, which lists everyone um, and their ID, which is always the, your gateway into anywhere in the system. And then you need the ID with which you access uh, anything you want. And this, for that, in order for it to be secure, it needs to have two-factor authentication. This overcomes the problem that was in, um, in the 1993 New Yorker cartoon. Many of you probably have seen it somewhere. It's a dog and another dog. And one dog says to the other dog, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. And this is the problem of identity, that you, in order for digital governance to work, you must be sure that you are talking to the government. The government must be sure they're talking to you, and if whoever you're talking to needs to know you're you. And so the way to solve this is by having a unique identity. No one else has that identity. And it needs to be secure, which means, first of all, you use two-factor authentication, you use it nowadays in the U.S. with a, with a um, credit card that has a chip on it. 
So you put in the card, and then you put in a code, but what that, that really is is two-factor authentication, meaning you, it's something you have and something you know. So what you have in your possession is that chip. And then you put in the, the code, and they have to match up, the chip and the code. So that if someone has your card, well, they, don't, they can't really use it because they don't know, I mean, you don't know the code. So that, that gives you the identity security. And then the other side of that is end-to-end -end encryption. So that once you get a match between the, the, uh, <clears throat> the chip and the code, then everything from, there, from that device you're using to wherever you're going is encrypted end to end, which means that no one can get in there. And where, it, where then the policy part comes in is that for any kind of digitization to work, it, having a digital identity must be mandatory. Everyone must have it. And this is where the big problem first, the first big problem that comes in because we know from all kinds of studies and from, I mean, basically real life, that if you offer a digital identity to people, which is then the government offering a digital identity, the uptake will be about 15 to 25% of the population. Um, the problem with that uptake is that you won't get anything done because when 15 to 25% of the population opts for, they're the early adopters, the people who in the 20 years ago would buy a Mac, you know, those are the people who would get a chip. The other people don't bother. Well, what does that mean? That means every agency, every service, every ministry will say, why the hell should I invest money in developing a service if only 80, you know, between 75 and 85% of the population doesn't, I mean, that percentage doesn't use it anyway. Which then, I mean, this is a real chicken and egg problem, which means that the 15% the or the 20% that has actually gotten an ID can't use it for anything because it's just it's a nice card and you can actually use it to cross a border in Europe, but that's about it because you can't do anything. And so um, I remember the Spanish ambassador came to see me in about 2008. And he said that I made my usual joke about our weather, and I said, well, I guess you, I mean, he was leaving, and he was retiring. I said, well, I guess you won't mind leaving our wonderful weather. And he said, yeah, I'm not going to miss that, but I will miss your digital prescriptions. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I have, a, I have registered my Spanish uh, digital identity. With in Estonia, and so I can go and, and I can use, get, use digital prescriptions, uh, so no paper prescriptions, and you just like email your doctor saying, could you re-up my prescription? And he said, it's really convenient. I said, well, you have an idea. What, what, what about Spain? He said, yeah, well, we don't have any services connected to the, ide to the identity. It's just, it's nice, and it works for crossing the border if we really need to, but other than that, I can't get anything done. So that's the first point. You need a strong digital identity. The second part is you need a population registry. The second part is really about the architecture of the system. Now, I will now talk about a specific kind of architecture that we in about 25 countries right now use. Uh, we invented it. It's called a distributed data exchange layer. It is not a distributed ledger. It is a distributed data exchange layer. And um, well, I'll get to that in a minute. But basically, uh, it's, if anyone's ever interested, it's an uh, open source architecture, which you can get if you go to uh, NIIS.org, which is an organization that now handles this uh, open source software. Um, but the first thing you need is a population registry. As I mentioned before, everyone has a unique identifier and everything goes through that population registry, which says that, yes, uh, you are you and therefore you're entitled to all these things, or you can go and 
do things here and there. Uh, I would just say about a population registry, it's one reason why in places that have them, we do not understand this concept of voter registration at all. If you are in the population registry, you're in there. And in there it says, are you a citizen or you're not a citizen? Or, I mean, it says all kinds of things. But basically, if you're a citizen, the most fundamental aspect of democracy is the right to vote. I mean, all these kind of shenanigans I keep reading about where, you know, people are deprived of their right, of, their right to vote because they're not registered or they haven't voted in a certain amount of That doesn't matter. That's, if you're a citizen, you get to vote if you want to. And so, to my knowledge, which is about two years late, I mean, sort of outdated, but at least Oregon, I think, was the only state in the union that actually had a population registry. No one else did, at least two years ago. And then that's, that's the first part of the architecture. The second part is what we, which is the, really the main point, which is we have a distributed data exchange layer. What that means is that all of the data is out there, kind of like Christmas tree balls all over space. There is no central registry. There's not even an agency registry. And this is so that you can access your data by, by, through your ID, and that is then, and then you make your choice as to what you want. Do you want to look at your medical records? Do you want to look at your property records? Do you want to, look, do you want to vote? I mean, whatever it is you want to do, you have to ID yourself, and then it gets, <clears throat> once you're authenticated, you get to where you want to go. And um, the reason why everything is a distributed data exchange layer, the best example is if uh, you know anyone who's ever worked for the federal government before 2015, you know, the, you know of the OPM hack, the Office of Personnel Management hack, which, in which uh, the data for 23 million uh, and current and former employees of the federal government was just like <laughs> sucked out. Most people think it was China, but we still, I mean, at least no one, publicly no one says anything about who did it, but in any case. And these data included, among other things, the psychological profiles of CIA agents, not to mention their home addresses and all these other things. This is why you don't keep all your data in one place. Of course, they, they were even dumber because they kept the data in clear text, which meant it wasn't even encrypted. So <laughs> you save everybody a lot of time. Um, so, and to, to understand how the distributed data exchange layer works, I'm gonna show you mercifully only a two and a half minute video. But I do need to do this show and tell because it's not clear. Running a modern state is a data-centered endeavor. Ensuring the functioning of the state requires administering very large quantities of data. Estonia lacks a centralized, or master, database. Data is stored where it is created. Each agency administers its own data separately, and data is not duplicated. At the same time, state authorities and agencies need data outside their purviews in order to function. For example, the police constantly require information from the population register. Likewise, the unemployment insurance fund depends on information from the health information system. How can authorities securely exchange important data? First, the data must be easily accessible by the authorities that are authorized to use it. Second, the integrity of the data must be maintained. No third party should be able to make any changes to the data while it is in transit. Third. The data must remain confidential during its journey. It must be protected from the eyes of unauthorized parties. The X-Road is a data exchange platform that fulfills all three of these requirements. The X-Road makes life simpler for both the state and the citizens. For example, when a child is born, information about the birth is sent directly from the hospital to the population register. From there, it is sent automatically to the health insurance fund so that the child will have health insurance and a family physician. This prevents the creation of excessive paperwork and saves time. The state functions in the background. 
The X-Road helps authorities make work processes more convenient. Many activities can be automated, which frees employees to deal with matters that require human involvement. Authorities also don't have to worry about the authenticity of data. They can be confident that data received from the tax board definitely originated from the actual tax board. Additionally, the X-Road can be used regardless of what technology an authority uses. For the state, the X-Road, above all, makes it possible for authorities to efficiently exchange data among themselves. Sensitive information moves securely, and the system itself is so resilient that it cannot be easily brought down by those with malicious intentions. Since the birth of X-Road in 2001, the system has operated continuously without interruption. The X-Road helps the state see the big picture of how different authorities are connected to one another. In addition, the X-Road makes it possible to exchange data not only within the country, but also across national borders. That is, of course, if databases and information systems are working properly. The biggest beneficiaries of the X-Road are, of course, the citizens. They enjoy the benefits of a better functioning state and save all of the time they would otherwise spend submitting papers and forms. How much time? Hmm? During the time it took you to watch this animation, the X-Road saved around 240 working hours in Estonia. Cool. So basically, um, what it does, I think my mic is off, hello? Yes. What it does is, um, it, allow, it changes the entire nature of bureaucracy since it was invented. Bureaucracy has always been a serial or sequential process. Uh, I mean, whether it's papyrus or a paper for the DMV, you go to an office and once you get to the window, you give them a piece of paper and they take the paper and then they go process it and um, sometimes it, I don't know how, long, how all the things it has to go through, but you know, it goes to someone else, they go and look up the file, pull it out, look at it, stamp it, or don't stamp it, and anyway, that all happens. What this does, and this, the birth case, is interesting because the guy who designed that did it out of personal, from his personal experience, which was that when his uh, first kid was born, he, the kid was born, and then he had to go and register, he went to the population registry to sign him up for an ID. Then he had to go to the health insurance place to get him health insurance, then he had to go to the uh, Bureau of Vital Statistics, or what do we call it, where to get a, get a birth certificate. Um, it's all sort of, um, the system was all supply side based, is another way of looking at it. Whereas the demand, the, the citizen had to do all the work. Whereas now, uh, the way it works is the kid's born, the hospital says what's his or her name. They send the name off saying, you know, on this day, John Smith was born, and then the population registry gives him a number and issues an ID, and it informs the Bureau of Vital Statistics that this kid has been legally born in Estonia, and then if his parents are, one of his parents is Estonian, he's, he's a citizen, which gives him all kinds of rights, and then the health insurance company gets this new customer for as long as the kid is a minor, he's under the, he's covered, so all those things are done. And uh, where it says they sa save 240 hours, I mean the way I, we look at it, or I look at it, is that basically it saves us about 2% of GDP. Which if you know anything about NATO, you know, is also the minimum requirement for, for uh, NATO demands of people or countries, rather, to spend on defense. So we basically, thanks to the digitization, get, uh, <laughs> we get free defense. But in any case, then the third pillar of what you have to solve. I mean, you don't have to use X-Road. I would advise using some form of uh, digital data exchange layers for the same security reasons that we opted for it. 
But yeah, you can use any kind of other architecture. But the third problem you have to deal with is data integrity. Now, data integrity is it's kind of like privacy, but not quite, because privacy is about someone getting your data and publishing it. My blood type, for example, or my bank account, or anything else. I mean, all the things that people are worried about when it comes to privacy. I argue, and I think it's true, that far more important is data integrity. Because one, the privacy thing can be annoying, but, but data integrity, if you don't have that, you can die. I mean, if, if someone publishes my blood type, nah. Someone changes the record of my blood type, I mean, except for me, because I'm type AB, so I can take anything. But if you're type O, uh, you can be in real trouble. And so what we, since 2007 or 8, uh, we have put all critical national data on the blockchain. But we don't do the blockchain as in Bitcoin, but we use a, a keyless signature infrastructure, which does not need to, all the proof of work stuff that you need. It just, every, all the, the data, each data block is hashed. So it just says this is a block, and if it's altered, then you can see that the hash has been sort of broken. Um, and it's a closed, it's a closed system. So it really, uh, or a permission system. Unlike, again, all the cryptocurrencies, it doesn't have to get all these approvals, but rather it needs five, six, or seven approvals from, from the relevant government agencies. So it says, yes, this is a legitimate transaction. And so we have that for our health records, all our laws. We don't publish a paper version of the congressional record or the Hansard in the UK, it's all online. But what happens if someone goes and hacks into the system and changes the law? I mean, this could, and then if you know, you look it up and said, oh, that's legal, I mean, why can't I do that? So the laws are on blockchain. Court cases, similarly, if, you, if there's a court decision and someone goes, changes the court decision, again, it ruins everything, property records, uh, all are based on uh, the keyless signature infrastructure, and that's also, since it's almost instantaneous, I mean, it's highly scalable, and it's also instantaneous, unlike sort of cryptocurrencies. As a fun thing, which is utterly irrelevant for the United States, but relevant for small countries in bad neighborhoods or that in, are in seismically sensitive areas, we have we created something called a data embassy. So, I mean, we, have, we don't have any seismic activity where Estonia is at all, but uh, we have been invaded uh, sort of on an average of twice a century for the past thousand years. And so, you know, we're kind of worried about that. So what we came up with, and this was inspired, or if that's the word, by the Fukushima tsunami, in which Japan lost some small, but nonetheless important part of its national data. I don't know whether it was the tsunami itself or whether it was thanks to the meltdown of the, but in any case, so we came up with this idea that um, appealing to the Vienna Convention on the Extraterritoriality of Embassies, we went to a number of countries, but we settled on Luxembourg, and we said, we'd like to declare a server our embassy, which means that it has, you can't go to it. You're just like you can't break into it, you can't go to, into an embassy, you can't go into the server. And so we signed this agreement with them, and so we have a 24-7 dedicated uh, real-time update of all critical data that we have. So, you know, the kid's born, the same process, and not only is the reg birth registered in Estonia, it's also registered in Luxembourg. You sell your house, it's registered in Estonia, it's registered in Luxembourg. And, um, I mean, again, I say, you don't need this in the United States. I mean, all you need to do is just have 
another place. I mean, it's so big, but we're small and, you know, get invaded or... I would also recommend it for a country like Greece, which, you know, or Turkey. You know, Turkey's maybe big enough. I don't know. You can, but in any case, small countries with, uh, that have problems, like uh, either security or any kind of security. I mean, you know, earthquakes, invasions, hurricanes. I mean, Puerto Rico might want to do something like this. So anyway. Um, that's like the final thing we do. We used to send out once a month, for the same reason, a, a set of CD-ROMs to our embassies, literally, our real embassies, and then the ambassador would get these CD-ROMs and put it into a safe. But this, this way, it's all up to date 24-7. Now, why does this work? Well, first of all, one of the these curious things is that, you know, people say, I don't trust the government. Well, in fact, the government, in the sense, it's a, in a parliamentary system, the government is like what, two, three, or one in the case of the UK, parties, and you hate the people who run the thing. But the administration of the country is something that people, in, at least in my country, they love the administration. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, you'll take away my digital identity when you pry my cold dead fingers from my card. I mean, that's the kind of attitude. So people love the card, they hate the government, as always. As I mentioned, the other benefit is that bureaucracy becomes a parallel process, so things work quickly. One of the real benefits that we have found is that it eliminates petty corruption. Because in so many countries, again, the US, and rich countries are an outlier, I mean, don't have this problem, but in even middle-income countries and with a culture of something, I don't know what you call it, but anyway, in order to get a service, you have to pay uh, a bureaucrat something. So I remember talking to an Indian when I was talking about the system, and I said, this is great, it gets rid of petty corruption. He goes, nah, wait a minute, you know, basically our government is based on the idea that we don't pay our civil servants because they're gonna get their money from taking their cut. And so this would not work politically because then, I mean, if we did it, then we'd have to pay the civil servants a livable salary, whereas right now we don't have to worry about it. But petty corruption is eliminated in Estonia, which has always been by far the least corrupt country of the former commie countries, now is one of the least corrupt countries in the European Union, that is with all these old Western countries that are far more corrupt than we are. We're not very corrupt, I mean, frankly, we're not. But in Europe, I mean, all these sort of old traditional European countries have a much higher level of corruption than we do. And then, of course, the big thing about all of this, which I'll just go into a little bit of cybersecurity because I'm going to run out of time, is that, uh, as you saw from this, from the short video, basically, you don't get things like the OPM hack. If there is a breach, you will um, I mean, the worst you can do is hit one person in the country because, I mean, then you're really lucky to have hit that person and, I mean, it's almost impossible to do that. There are, uh, as um, Professor Sagan at Stanford has pointed out, like most things that are really bad come from inside jobs and we had one inside job in which a policewoman who was kind of the, she was the sys administrator, systems administrator or sysadmin, who couldn't help herself, but she went to check up on her boyfriend. But the system is done so that any unauthorized visit into anything immediately sets off bells and whistles. And so as soon as she did that, everything you know, started clanging, and they figured, oh, you did it. And she was escorted out of the building, fired, and later on convicted. Um, and my last act as president was to, because I felt sorry for her, because she was such a poor, I mean, she's just dumb. I, just, I said, okay, I, I, I give you clemency. When it comes to cybersecurity, um, we are known also for the massive DDoS or distributed denial of service attacks of 2007, which according to von Clausewitz's definition of war as the continuation of policy by other means was probably the first official cyber war because before that there have been all kinds of cyber attacks but they were never for a political end, and most of the time, 
no one ever talked about them, you know. So the first big hack of the U.S. Uh, DOD was the um, Moonlight Mile uh, hack of 1999. Well, that all came out later, but this, this just shut down the country for us because the DDoS attack, it never gets into the system, it just shuts off your servers because they're all overwhelmed. Um, since then, uh, we have spent so much time on DDoS, dealing with DDoS, as well as the other kinds of security, um, that um, we are now rated both by the UN and the European Union as having the most, the best cybersecurity in Europe. Uh, just to go a little further, and I would say, and then kind of get a little more spacey, I would say that um, cybersecurity will become more and more of an issue. I argue that, the, uh, that in the cyber era, which basically began around the turn of the millennium, that slowly the geopolitical importance of kinetic warfare is decreasing dramatically. Uh, even in the case of Ukraine today, which people say, well, see, you still need real armies. You do need, re need real armies, but Ukraine is under constant cyber attack. But they have a very good, they have, they're highly resilient because they've actually, after being, uh, getting a massive uh, cyber attack in 2015, which shut down the electricity for large parts of the country, they have done an amazing work. More importantly, than just cyber attacks, which can basically take down a country. It's that unlike kinetic warfare, which is based on, you know, force equals mass times acceleration, if you remember your high school physics, acceleration is distance divided by time squared, but the point is a cyber attack doesn't, doesn't have mass. There's no di distance is irrelevant. Time on Earth is infinitesimally short. And so when you think about that, okay, well, you can you do all kinds of damage, but um, you don't need, I mean, kinetic force doesn't work. Well, what does that mean? It means that basically NATO, for example, as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, in some ways becomes kind of irrelevant. Because, I mean, NATO, when it was established in 1949, NATO, why is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and why a country like Japan is not in NATO is because it's the North Atlantic. And why is it the North Atlantic? It has to do with bomber range, fighter refueling, troop transport, ammunition logistics. I mean, all the stuff that you see happening on the ground in Ukraine today. But a cyber attack, meh, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, as I like to say, Tallinn, Torino, Toronto, Topeka, Tokyo, Taipei, Tasmania, and Tauranga in New Zealand, plus Seoul, I couldn't find a T town there, um, are all equidistant. Uh, and at the same time, we know that these people who are doing these things don't care about national borders. So you can take two of the main hacking groups, APT 28 and 29, using the CIA nomenclature. I mean, they have, in, they have attacked the State Department, the DOD, the US Congress, the Bundestag in Germany, but also the think tanks in Germany. They've attacked the Foreign Ministry of Denmark and of Italy and the Netherlands. They've even attacked WADA which is the World Anti-Doping Agency. Why do they attack WADA? Uh, they attack WADA because WADA had all this information about doping by the athletes of Russia. So this APT28, I mean, it's either tied to one of the, it's tied to one of the two uh, security agencies, be it sort of the GRU, which is military intelligence, or the SVR, which is just their intelligence. Um, and they hacked into there. So, I mean, the point is that they don't care about national borders, and national borders mean nothing in cyberspace, uh, and that means that we have to rethink our security, uh, and that's a very hard thing to do because we're not used to 
dealing with cybersecurity on a, on a, uh, in any kind of international setting. Because cybersecurity grew out of signals intelligence, you know, the NSA in the US, GCHQ in the UK, and anything that's tied to spying, you never want to tell anybody. So that means, for example, when in about 2011 we discovered a Russian worm in our military networks, we went to NATO and said, look what we discovered, a Russian worm in our military networks. And the answer from NATO was, oh, you too. That's not the right answer. You know, I mean, this is, but I mean, I was assured recently that no, we're much better now. But the point is that these organizations, as they are currently set up, are not set up to deal with these issues. I have now been talking for 48 minutes, so I will stop there, but I think I can answer questions for as long as you'd like, because I can go on and on about this stuff, you know? It's kind of like my accordion didn't work today. Sometimes I give 15-minute speeches, sometimes I give an hour and a half speech, and I just sort of try to, uh, try to fit the audience, and I almost did it today, but thank you. Okay, thank you. So I think we have about five minutes. I'm getting waved, at, that's an overestimate. Um, so what I suggest we do, uh, because we will have about a 30 minute reception where we can hang out, have a cup of coffee or something, and, and you can uh, talk to President Ilvis as well, is to gather a couple questions from the audience, perhaps uh, give a President Ilvis a chance to respond, and I think that'll be our event for the evening. So I don't, if there's a question from the audience that you'd like to bring up. Thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Elizabeth Mothani. I'm a second year MPP student at GPS, and I'm from Kenya, where there's a lot of petty corruption <laughs> and uh, a lack of political will to digitize the systems. Uh, my question would be, how do you not inspire, or I don't know the right word, show the benefits of the systems to provide efficient services to the citizenry and the benefits of it for a political group that is not morally willing. Thank you. Um, you start with things that people like or rather that they hate to do on paper. So one of the first things we did was uh, taxes. And people hate to fill out their taxes. Um, even though it's much simpler in my country than it is in the U.S., I mean, they hate it anyway. And we had, a, as a nudge, you know, whatever his name is, who had the theory of the nudge, right? It's, it's, if you filled your taxes out online, you were basically instantaneously received your refund. And if you did it on paper, well, we'd get to it eventually. So, so I mean, you have these little nudges, and then... Uh, Oh, well, another example is a digital prescription, which, uh, again, people saying, what is this? This is, you know, I want my paper prescription, but within three months, we got a complete hockey stick. I mean, sort of people, a few of the you know, early adopters started using it, and they found it was so much simpler to basically have your doctor write the prescription, and you go to any pharmacy and ID yourself, and then you get your medicine, as opposed to getting, going to the doctor, getting a piece of paper, Having to get, I mean, if you want to refill, it's even worse because you have to still get the piece of paper. And so, you know, 2006, 2007, we had digital prescriptions, and within three months after we introduced it, basically 99% of the population uses a digital prescription. I mean, the digital prescription is not really a major brainwave, uh, and now even the U.S. has it, kind of, I guess. But, uh, but. Anyway, it works, and those kinds of things people like, and then they prefer to use that because it's much simpler. And less so for us because we were already so digital, but I know some other countries, um, uh, when we got to COVID, uh, digitized services really made a difference. Uh, when I was, I remember in June of, Early June, late May of 2020, I uh, read an article in the New York Times about how the U.S. had a backlog of three million passport renewals because the offices were closed. Um, I also had to renew my passport 
I, I mean, I, I didn't have to wait. I mean, I just did it, right? I mean, that was, um, so you get, I mean, it's just more convenient, so people like it. The thing about the corruption is that you take decisions, non-discretionary decisions, that is, you are, you know, you're at a certain age or you have a certain whatever you have. I mean, whatever it is you need to qualify. If you have that, you don't have to deal with a bureaucrat because the computer already knows. Yes, you have this disability, you have that. I mean, you're that age, you have three kids, whatever it is, all the things that you need for a specific thing. The computer says, yeah, you have that. And then uh, if, you're, if it's money, it just gets deposited in your bank account. My understanding is that India has made great progress in what you might be referring to as the mandatory registry, that they do an iris scan, a DNA scan, and a fingerprint scan, and that something like 90, 95% of the population participates, but the higher-ups do not li like it and do not want to participate in this. Would it be legitimate to demand that you participate or else you lose your job? Well, in our case, you just have to have an ID. <laughs> I mean, that's, I don't know. Uh, I mean, the Aadhaar system, which is the Indian system, uh, has had also some big problems because a lot of stuff was leaked. So that actually decreased trust in the system. And really, again, the, the second sort of pillar of this, which is um, where I, to my understanding, I mean, you know, this is, goes back a, a couple of years, but the services are not developed there. But maybe they have in the past two years. I mean, this is the point I keep making, is you need to offer people services. If you don't, or more precisely, if you must invest, uh, I mean, agencies, services, ministries, be it the health ministry or whatever it is. I mean, they, they have to invest money to make the services digital. Otherwise, you just have an ID, and, but it doesn't get you anything, like the Spanish ambassador I mentioned. That, I mean, it's a nice ID, but it works in other countries. It just, I mean, in Europe, they're, they, they're interchangeable. You just have to register your ID, and then you can use it in Estonia. Uh, but if at home he didn't have any services, I mean, so it was like, hey, okay. There's a, there's a whole bunch of hands up. I think, why don't we take one question that will take us on the way out? So this will be a question, you can pose it and it'll propose, it'll stimulate conversation uh, going forward and we can follow up after that. So. Thank you very much uh, for uh, this discussion. I'm, I'm Eric Hicks, I'm a former UCSD student and I'm uh, involved in IT and cybersecurity here in San Diego. My question is around uh, resilience of the Estonian uh, cyber infrastructure. You mentioned X-Road and you mentioned blockchain and you mentioned making the servers embassies, that's what I recall. Are there other, are there other things that are done uh, to make the Estonian um, infrastructure more resilient or does that take care of it for you, for the country? Oh no, there are all kinds of, there's constant monitoring going on of um, critical infrastructure. I mean, the, I mean, that's our big fear, is that, okay, you're going to hack the electrical grid. So, in fact, much of the, uh, the, the body or the agency that is involved in running this whole thing is devoted to actually critical infrastructure and constant monitoring. Water supply, electrical supply, electrical plants. I mean, these are all things that are vulnerable in all countries. That's what, I mean, that's what the Russians attacked in Ukraine in uh, 2015. We should knocked out like, I don't know, I mean, all of Kharkiv uh, Oblast and if not more, but anyway, that, um, if you read David Sanger's book, The Perfect Weapon, he actually describes the, the Ukraine hack, uh, 
what the effects were. Um, they had no idea what was going on. It was kind of like when, I, we didn't, when we got our DDoS attack, I, we didn't know what was going on because what happened then was, you know, I got up in the morning and I couldn't access any of my websites that were Estonian. However, I could access the Financial Times and I could access, and DDoS attacks have gotten much worse because back then they were done by botnets, which are basically bots that people had in their computers 25% of computers in the world had bots. They had, and the main source of bots is going on free porn sites. So don't go on free porn sites. Uh, don't go on porn sites, but I mean, if you're gonna go on porn sites, don't like pay for it. So 25% of the, of the PCs had, had bots in it, and then you had botnets, and they were run by mafioso groups that in fact mainly spent, I mean, they got their money from Viagra ads or things like that. Good for if you're into porn, right? But anyway, so they would send these out in shotgun fashion. But the DDoS attack is you can just invert the process where a net, you would attack a single server. So it was a bank server or some other server. I mean, the banks were the immediate thing. And the newspapers were hit. And so I looked at this and said, well, this is abroad, but anything here isn't working, what's up? And then I called the relevant agency and said, what the hell's going on? Now today, um, no one uses uh, mafioso-run botnets because they're so puny. What you do is you take over 500,000 closed-circuit televisions in London, for example. I mean, that's, I mean, and IoT devices are really the, the prime target for doing DDoS attacks, and these are far, these are orders of magnitude more massive. The Mirai attack in 2016 autumn took out the west, the east coast of the United States and, and the UK and some of the west coast, uh, east, west coast of Europe. Uh, and I mean, the problem is that if you have a, you know, your router, it comes with, uh, it's usually set either to one, two, three, four, five, or it's set to zero, 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 zero. And if you don't change the code on that, then you can be immediately hacked, and it doesn't, I mean, if you want to be, have your device taken away from you, uh, then, you know, I mean, there are basically, in the past, there used to be two options, really, zero, 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 or one, two, three, four, five. Um, and if you try those, you get most of them. And you have closed circuit TVs, which also don't necessarily, I mean, I don't know, closed circuit TVs are all over, and you just get those to then be your, the, 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 the attack, attacker for, you know, a focused server. I think that's our time for today. So thank you so much. Join me in thanking uh, President Ilvis, and please hang out for a little bit.